Hello and welcome to episode 2 of Hibs.pod. Today we're delighted to be joined by a World Cup cap, Hibs newest midfielder and all-round good guy, Jackson Irvine. We'll cover a little bit about what it was like to be a Hibs fan in the month of March and we'll start to look ahead optimistically at what Europe might look like next season. So without further ado, get into the episode. Thanks for that, Gav. Uh, yeah, good to be back doing our um, second episode. Um, similar similar format to last time. Um, we bit housekeeping at the start, then we'll have the interview, and we'll just have a bit of general Hibs chat um, at the end. Um, we're also going to um, have continue with the quickfire five, just so you can get to, to know us all a little bit better as well. Um, so I think I'll start by saying, first of all, we mentioned last month we would be um, raffling a signed Louis Stevenson strip. We've not got around to to doing that yet um but keep an eye on both the forum and the social media because it will be will be coming up soon and we promise it will be done before the next episode yeah exactly and you know we are on episode two now so that's us officially a series which is which is fun there's an <laughs> achievement cool uh, so i think yeah we'll, we'll lead into quick five five i think you took the lead on that last time so uh, i'll i'll fire up your questions now if you're ready yep yeah. Cool. So firstly, I know you're a keen runner. Uh, which Hibs player, past or present, could you most confidently be over 100 metres? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, I think Michael Nelson must be a, a good <laughs> shout. He, um, he wasn't a guy who exactly um, came out as much of a speedster. So yeah, I'll go for him. Yeah, turning so of a bus. <laughs> most unexpected place you've bumped into another Hibs fan? Um... I can't really think of too many places where I've bumped into Hibs fans unexpectedly. Certainly, like on holiday abroad, you know, sort of when I've went to to seek out a game in sort of weird and wonderful cities. Generally speaking, it tends to be sort of like an Irish bar or a Scottish bar that's showing Scottish football. So, um, I bumped into a few guys there. Um, I, I do remember, and um, this isn't actually bumping into a fan, but I went into um a pub in Horncastle, which is a little um sort of market town in Lincolnshire. And seen some Hibs graffiti in the toilets, which I did think was <laughs> was quite interesting. So I'll kind of cheat and say that. Now we'll take it. So you've just been selected as the new CEO of Hibs. Uh, which member of the current squad is going to be your top owner? <laughs> I think um, the the man that we we're, we're speaking to later on, um, Jack Snover, would probably be um, pretty pretty close um, there. I mean, with the goalkeeping situation, I think if we could do do anything to convince um, Rocket to stay. Um, I would probably probably go for that as well, just for the the continuity. At a time when we're probably going to be doing a bit of a rebuild on the defence, I think sticking with the same goalkeeper would be would be a benefit. But yeah, probably probably one of those two. So last live event that you attended before lockdown, but wasn't a football match. Um, I, I was one of the um, the half a million or quarter of a million. It was crazy people who was at Cheltenham um, in. 2020 uh, my, my dad and I I'd got tickets from uh, well I had tickets and I got tickets from my dad's 60th um, and the two of us went down and yeah thinking back now it was it was just crazy not just on our part I mean there was, there was Scotland rugby fans in the airport heading to Cardiff there was um, you know um, we were in Glasgow airport so there was people who had um, been at the Rangers game previously like sort of flying it, it was just if, if you knew then what you know now I wouldn't have been there but yeah it was Cheltenham yeah it seems crazy it went ahead final question Best Hibs Barnet of all time, inspired obviously by Jackson. Um, oh, that's a good one. I always um remember when um Benji um first signed for us, he had um quite a a unique um a unique haircut um and I, I think um so I, I think I'd probably go something like that. Um, also uh, Kevin Harper's uh, mid nineties dreadlocks mm. were um were a were a fashion statement at the time as well. So, so one of those two. Um, so is that is that my five? Yeah, that's you done. Um, right, so for your five, um, out with football, what, what's your favourite sport to, to watch or participate in? Uh, I do like the egg chasing, I have to say, and, and Scotland's recent performances have probably helped that. Perfect. Um, and I know that the, the sort of key answer for you is, um, is going to be Norwich, but other than, other than Hibs um, and Norwich, what's, what's your favourite sort of football team, um, home or abroad? Um, I actually grew up in East London, so uh, I've got a bit of a, a soft spot for West Ham. Good stuff. Um, when when you visit Edinburgh, your favourite favourite pub to to go to? Oh, this is where you're going to embarrass me. Um, God, let's say the Hibs Club. <laughs> I think that's a pretty safe, safe answer, right? Um, what sort of something, um, whether it be a, an actual thing or you know a passion that you really couldn't live without? Um, I guess taking a leaf from from our guest book, uh, 
I'm, I'm big into my music. Um, I play guitar, but I think also I grew up in a in a large Irish family and surrounded by folk musicians. So I can't really imagine my life without music being in it. So yeah, I'd, I'd go with music. Good stuff. And finally, uh, your favorite favorite book. Oh, see, my favorite book is always the last one I read. I find <laughs> reading a book is such an investment. <laughs> you you kind of have to pick good ones. Um, I'll say. The Origins of Totalitarianism by Hannah Arendt. I think it's really important right now as well. Um, it's a dense read. It's like 500 pages, but it's definitely worth your time. Yeah, no, that's quite quite, quite topical as well, I think. Mm. Um, yeah, so there we go. Now you know um, some more useless, useless facts about both of us. Exactly. Put it on Wikipedia. <laughs> Okay, so I think um, without further ado, we'll go straight into our interview with um, Jackson, um, who is now going to come on and join us. Thanks very much for for taking the time out to uh, join us today, Jackson. Um, I think the, the first question, sort of just to lead off on, um, so is football related. Um, you've obviously been at Hibs a, a few months now. Um, it's just how have you enjoyed your time so far? And I think the sort of generic question that um, every footballer get asked, gets asked at the moment is, how is sort of empty stadiums, the sort of bubble situation, how, how has it been a different experience to, to normal? Well, I suppose to start off, yeah, with my experience at, at Hibs so far, it's been everything kind of, and more from from what I was hoping the experience would bring me coming back to Scotland. Um, obviously, I was out of the game for a while, had a really difficult few months, um, you know, from a personal and professional point of view, not being playing and during the COVID, you know, this COVID world we're in, it was quite a unique scenario to be a kind of a, a free agent um, within. And yeah, eventually when the time came and um, I could finally got myself sorted up with Hibs and a chance to come back and be involved with the Scottish game again and you know, come back to the country that, you know, started my career and, um, you know, it brought me kind of so much, it's brought me so much success, it's, it's been amazing and the club has been nothing but, um, you know, helpful with me and everyone within the club from the manager to, to the support staff, to the backroom staff, everyone's just been, um, you know, made it so easy for me to, to get up to speed and get the best out of my performances and, you know, and comfortable off the pitch as well, which is always important. So, um, I've enjoyed every aspect of, of my time at Hibs so far. Um, probably apart from the fact that we haven't got to play in front of the fans, which would be, you know, lead on to that question, which is probably the only disappointing part of it. Um, but, you know, that's just the world we live in now. We've kind of adapted to the new normal. Um, you know, the training, you know, in terms of the protocols and the training ground and the day-to-day -day of things, that has just become routine. It's not really unusual. It is still unusual, I suppose, the fan side of things. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's funny as footballers, we, we thrive on routine and, and um, I, I feel like most players have started to just kind of get used to, get used to it. And it does, it's just changed certain aspects of the game. I feel like the games are quicker and, you know, the balls in, you know, little things like the ball comes back into play faster. I think, you know, in, the, in games with fans, you tend to, you know, you, when you feel in the pressure a bit, you maybe put the brakes on, um, you know, on a throw in or a goal kick, and you think, whoa, we need a reset here. But you know, the, ten the game tends to flow in a different way. Um, but yeah, you know, at the end of the day, you just miss the atmosphere. That's what we thrive on as players. It's what you enjoy more than anything. And cannot wait to, to see fans back in sooner rather than later. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, you, you touched on it there that you spent a bit of time um, out of the game over the summer, which was obviously difficult. And um, when it came to, to signing for Hibs, um, you know, was it the, the first option you had or was it just the option that fitted best for you? And did, did you have sort of any preconceived notions of the club or the team um, before joining? Did it take any persuasion or was it quite a, quite an easy decision when it came along? Yeah, I think you're right when it's about um, it was the right fit um, for exactly what I was looking for it in that moment and um you know we only took one conversation I wasn't I, I spoke with the manager for about 40 minutes um you know one night and I basically agreed the next day uh that you know this was the right fit for me it was it had all the ingredients of, of what I wanted and um I suppose I the fact that I did know everything about the club in in terms of I you know I've been to the training ground where we used to play academy games and you know, I've played in the stadium before and I know a lot of the players and obviously, you know, Martin from Boyley from the national team and Scotty from, you know, 
years at Celtic and stuff. Just like yeah, I had it. Um, it made the most sense to in terms of it, it would require very little settling time. Um, well, as little settling time as you could probably have when it comes to coming back into football after not having played for ten months. Yeah, definitely. Um, you, you touched on it there. Obviously, your experience with uh, Martin Boyle in the the national team. Um, do you do you sort of follow the the A League still? And is there any sort of up and coming players there that we should be keeping an eye on? Um, obviously, at Hibs, we've had Jamie McLaren in the past too. Mm-hmm. I think he had a, a sort of mixed bag at Hibs. Um, so is, is there anyone there that you'd sort of say is a player to really keep an eye out on that could do something in Europe in the future? And Millsy as well, Mark Milligan. There's been a he's back at MacArthur now as well. So no, I, I follow the A League really closely. I'm a big fan of football in Australia, and I'm, I think that it's important that especially players like myself, overseas guys, that you know I've never I'm one of the only national team players that didn't come through in the A League. Obviously, I came over at a young age straight into the academy system at Celtic, and um, but it is somewhere that I, I do see myself playing eventually, and I think it's important that the you know the national team players support and follow the domestic league and and keep an eye on the as you say the young talent and the, the players like Jamie who's on fire again at the moment scoring goals left right and center as he has done you know during his time in the A League it's 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 a really good fit for him. Um but yeah no there's there's some very exciting young talented players and we've seen a lot of them uh you know a number of them move on into Europe from the A-League and have success as well. So hopefully there'll be another couple make that jump in the next few next year or so. On a, on a similar note, um, what, what other so Aussie sports do you follow, teams do you follow? Is it just football or are you into your rugby Aussie rules as well? I love Aussie rules. Played all through high school. Um, never really played our football for my school or anything because none of my mates played. Um, you know, most of my mates played footy or basketball um, in high school. So I played a lot of played a lot of Aussie rules all the way through school. Absolutely loved it. Um, I'm a big. I, I do follow the cricket. I probably don't follow it as closely as I used to. I still watch the Ashes and um, the kind of big, big Test matches with Australia, but not so much. But um, I, I follow a lot of. Uh, I really like the tennis and the, I watch the majors of the golf as well. And but probably the NBA is probably my the biggest sport I follow, but um, the, in terms of Australia, it's definitely Aussie rules. Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, w- one of the sort of questions is um, obviously it's quite well known um, sort of in the sport world from from a similar part of the world is with regards to sort of the whole culture around like the All Blacks, uh, rub, rugby, and your sort of Kiwi neighbours. Um, you know, and it's mm-hmm. very much about the team spirit and everyone mucking in and you know doing their bit. Is that something that's sort of prevalent in Australian sport as well? And is it different from football, or is it, or is it something that is very specific to sort of sort of New Zealand, if you like? Uh, I think they are the epitome of what it means to represent a team and have a team culture that you buy into at not even at all costs like that is just the standard like you that is the level you have to be at to be a part of that group i think it's well documented now that from most people would understand that that's the what every team culture probably thrives to have that kind of environment um we, with i can only really speak from the national team point of view but we have a, we have an extremely good team culture within the national team and that's been built through you know work done to four different managers over the kind of um six or seven years i've been involved and it's main. It's been a, um, um, it's maintained its way all the way through. Um, you know, I was lucky when I when I first came in. We still had a lot of really experienced heads. My, I remember my first ever camp. You know, guys like Lucas Neal and um, Mark Schwartz. who were still kind of older at the tail end of their careers, but were still there and you know, big characters with huge experience. And guys like Tim Cahill and Miller Yedinak, who were probably like, and Mark Milligan, who were probably the three main leaders of the of the group through the last you know, four or five years where I've really been involved and those guys set such a high standard all the time, like they're on and off the pitch. And at the end of the day, when your your biggest players are the ones that set those standards, you know, you know that you have to fall into, and it's not even about having to, like, I think you just naturally do it when that standard is set like that. And um, yeah, I've been very lucky with the pros that I've worked with in that. And I feel like that's something I've tried to bring with me through my domestic game as well. Excellent. I've got um, another question. It's actually came from one of our forum users. It's sticking with the Australian theme, but totally left field. Do you watch MasterChef Australia? And if so, <laughs> do you have any thoughts on the new judges? I don't watch. I don't. I, to, be don't honest, to be honest, I struggle. 
I do struggle a bit with Australian TV sometimes. It's like it's one of those things. I think I feel like a lot of Scottish people feel the same thing when they hear their accent on TV. Sometimes it just like it's like nails on a chalkboard. Um, so I don't I don't watch an awful lot of Aussie TV. I'll, I'll tell you that. And I've got another one actually that came from one of our four music, which I think is quite a fun question. You're obviously I'm quite well known for for some of your tattoos and a, a Simpsons mm-hmm. one in particular. So mm-hmm. if if you had to get a Hibs player tattooed on your body that kind of fitted in with a sort of <laughs> Simpsons persona, who would it be and why? Oh jeez, a crossover Hibs Simpsons crossover question. <laughs> um, to be fair, you could probably just super him. I could probably just cover Mo's face up with Martin Boyle, and that would just be <laughs> that wouldn't stick out. Like you wouldn't be too different. No, I'm not sure. There'd be um, there's a few guys that I think have got some uh, got a bit about them. But to be fair, if, if sticking on the tattoo theme, Melka's got some pretty cool. Um, he's got some cool tattoos as well of some of his like we'll call them geeky interests. I guess he's got like a Pokemon tattoo and stuff like that as well. <laughs> but, um, no, nice. but I couldn't I, I couldn't think of someone off the top of my head to be honest. That's a that's a good question. Yeah. Excellent. Um, just going back to football, is there any sort of, um, obviously Josh Doig would be the obvious one, but is there any sort of um, other young players at Hibs since you've been back that have sort of impressed you that you think um, are sort of on the cusp of the first team or that have got a, got a big future? Yeah, Doig, he's obviously been amazing. Um, you know, so far he's got such a bright future ahead of him. He's got a really good head on his shoulders. Um, you know, his athleticism and um, kind of natural physical ability is is something to you know for his for his age is quite special but his understanding of the game is improving all the time um you know he's i know he's kind of was primarily a center half i believe kind of coming through and you know he's kind of adapted his game into into that back role and it's probably that versatility will do nothing but good things for him moving forward as well um but you know from the ones that haven't played probably stevie bradley has been the standout for me at training um from what i've seen He's got absolutely fantastic ability. Yeah, he reminds me a bit of Tom Rogic from an from an Australian point of view. The way he moves, the way he can um, manipulate the ball, and obviously the left footed, the um, you know, but he's got two feet, can finish with both feet. Um, I think he's got a really bright future ahead of him as well. And you know, I wouldn't be surprised if hopefully he gets some minutes before the end of the season. And um, I'm going to hand you over to Gav to sort of speak about a few other things um, in a minute, but there's. Unfortunately, I've got to ask you the the, the million dollar question, or I think it's, I'm going to I'm going to turn it into two questions. Um, European football next season's obviously um, something that could be on the card for Hibs. Who who do you fancy a crack at in Europe, and will you be here to play in Europe for Hibs? In the we'll start with the short term part of that question, which is you know stealing third place will be is obviously the really short term priority. We've got a you know a, a good cushion going into the split, but. Um, as we know, anything can happen in these last five games. So we need to um, go into these first couple with a really good attitude and come out firing and hopefully get that third place sealed up uh, as quick as possible. And then, um, you know, if, if uh, you know, I've started having conversations with the club kind of about moving forward, as I'm sure it's been reported, you know, by the manager. And um, at the moment, we're not in a mad rush. Um, we're really comfortable with the way things have been going and progressing with myself with the club. and. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to, to kind of let it let it play out and, and see how the next few weeks go in particular. And, you know, if it does lead to, to your, your, me being involved in European football next season, oof, who, who, do you, who do you fancy? There'd be some uh, some exciting... Uh, it all, all depends, to be fair, if fans are back as well, because there'd be some exciting places to go and, uh, and be involved. One of my... Um, one of our Australian teammates plays for Red Star Belgrade. Um, and, you know, I've... I've watched a few of his games in the Champions League and Europa League this season and that atmosphere looks absolutely electric, like incredible. So maybe then that would be a, that would be a pretty exciting one to go and play in. Nice. Well, hope, hopefully you are here to, to enjoy some European football next season. I think everyone would be happy with that if that was the case. <laughs> yeah, we'd have been crucified if we didn't ask that question. So <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for being such a good diplomat. Yeah, so we wanted to move on now. Uh, those are questions from our forum members and obviously quite hips related but we, we also want to give you a bit of a platform to speak on some of your other passions. I mean, this kind of came about, we, we saw the interview you gave to a, a fashion publication quite recently um, and you said something that sort of sh- uh, struck us, which was footballers that have other passions are quite often ridiculed or it's often used as a stick to beat them if performances aren't going quite well on the pitch and obviously that's, that's quite a ludicrous perception. I mean, 
sort of starting on that, is that is that a culture that you see still prevalent in in football? Is it decreasingly so? Is it is it more of a of a fan issue now than it is a dressing room problem? Uh, listen, I think there's a few factors that play into it. Social media is a, is a huge part of it. I think um, nowadays it's it's become easier and easier for guys to share their passions and interests away from the game, but also it's people that platform access to be able to um, you know criticize and and publicly um, you know put you under pressure for those things. I remember I'll tell you a little story. I remember when I was at a Burn Albion and. Um, Every every few, a couple of days after training, we used to go out for a coffee after training with a couple of lads. A guy, Marvin Sordell, who a lot of people will remember, played TGMB at the Olympics, played for Watford Burnley in the Premier League, um, the Bolton. Um, and we we used to talk about this kind of stuff a lot because he was an unbelievably fascinating character. And people who follow him now will know that he has stepped away from football and has moved into a number of different things. He's a mental health advocate. You know, he started a production company. He works in. You know, he's got he's got his private pilot's license. He's, you know, he's one of these guys that has just been, but he found it really difficult. He, um, you know, through his, his time when, um, in the Premier League when he was put under a lot of pressure to just focus on football and, and not pursue his other passions. And, um, you know, I remember, I think it was Jesse Lingard at one point was getting put under crazy, crazy pressure because he, I think he released, a, he had some kind of clothing line or, did some work with the clothing label before a match, and I think it was just before a Manchester derby, which they then lost. And I remember it was on Sky Sports, and the pundits were basically saying, "Like, what's he doing? Think, you know, doing something like that?" And this is, you know, these are the these are the people who fans listen to. These are the highest guys. These are the guys that are, have got the most powerful voice within the game, in particular the ex pros. And I found oh, we were just. We, I remember us sitting around being just really disappointed and. You know, like when when is the good time to, to pursue it? You know, like is it if you do it, you, you know, you have to do it after a three 0 win, or you have to do it. You know, there is no you can't plan for these kinds of things. And um, you know, we, I'm hope, starting to see a culture shift in in the game, and I feel like guys are more comfortable now to talk about their other interests and and maybe share that with the public a little bit more, and you know, there'd be a little bit more understanding about it. But um, you know, we're ho- I'm hoping that, that one day that will become football and the person. The, the player underneath will become two separate entities more so than, than it probably is at the moment. Well, hopefully to, to aid in that, let's talk a little bit about your interests. Obviously, there's a guitar sitting behind you. Um, you might see there's one, mm-hmm. there's one behind me, although mine's not quite as nice as yours. Um, no, I'm sure it is. <laughs> um, talk us through some of your, your musical inspirations and, and sort of your, your style as a guitar player as well. So yeah, I started playing like really mainly in high school. Um, I did play a little bit before that when I was younger, but I was really in high school. I kind of really found my love for it and um, kind of two or three of my closest friends to school. That's what we used to spend most of our time doing after school. I was a part of a couple of school-based bands and ensembles, and then we had our own stuff that we used to do on the side. Um, and it, it kind of all stemmed from, I suppose when I was when I was younger, I was I was really into like heavy metal. Like I was, a, you know, I, I loved like Metallica and Iron Maiden and kind of like the big heavy guitar riffs of of that when I was younger. And then that moved more into my later high school years. We we listened to a lot of like hardcore and post hardcore music, which for most people just sounds like screaming. But we, you know, we were actually I was fascinated by the you know a lot of these guys had backgrounds in jazz and like were amazing technical guitarists and drummers in particular, but they found their way into, into kind of heavier music. And um, it's just something I've stuck with all the time. I probably don't play as much as I did in those years, but it's something that comes with me uh, everywhere I go. And um, I know I used to spend, you know, one of my mates uh, who was the kind of drummer and, uh, and guitarist and played both in our band and he had a garage, like, in his house like underneath the, the him, him and his dad made it into like a studio like padded the walls and stuff and we just used to go in there and just absolutely blast it as loud as we could for you know for hours and hours on end probably the reason i'm a little bit deaf now um but it was uh the amazing years and um, you know it's still a huge part of my life of i don't go you know anywhere without you know music being a part of it that's for sure nothing more cathartic than making a lot of noise so no, worries. you're ahead. Uh, so, what are some of the uh, the artists or albums that are getting a lot oh. of playtime in the urban household at the moment? Uh, at the moment, um, what have I been listening to at the moment? Well, the new Nick Cave and Warren Ellis have just released a new a new album called Carnage. Nick Nick Cave, who's people who follow me will know he's you know 
my favorite, probably my favorite artist, along with you know Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground. Um, so that's been that's been on play a lot. Uh, there's been a few uh, a few good things come out in the last in the last couple of weeks. I listened to actually surprisingly, I do like a bit of Lana Del Rey. Her new album's come out this week. A little bit of dream pop goes down the street with me as well. You know, you got to be able to mix it up. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, and uh, there's a, re- a really cool kind of indie rock band called um, Remember Sports, who I listen to a lot at the moment. They're from, there's a really cool show on Amazon at the moment called Wayne, um, which has got a really awesome kind of grungy soundtrack. Um, a lot of really cool tunes on that. So that's kind of been what I've been listening to the last few days, a couple of weeks. Nice one. Well, Hibs fans, take note and add them to your playlists or buy yeah. the vinyl. I think that's your recommendation, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, go for it, yeah. It kind of linked to, to your love of music is is a love of art and fashion. Um, we we wanted to, to kind of explore this a little bit creatively, so we've got a bit of a game. Right, so uh, Jackson, we've got some classic hip strips from different eras. Obviously, you're, you're into your fashion and um, streetwear and football is, is quite inexorably linked. And also there's quite a revival in, in retro kits being part of streetwear. Um, we just wanted to, to go through some of these classic hip strips, um, get a score out of 10 from yourself and, and sort of let us know some of your thoughts, whether you'd add them to your wardrobe or not. Oh, absolutely. Great. So we're going to start off here. We've got the 8788 home kit. Oh, big fan. I like, I like that a lot. I love that kind of, um, there was a period of a lot of those Adidas um, strips. What is this, 87, did you say? 87, 88? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, oh yeah, this is like really cool, really cool necklines. I remember the, it's very quite, that necklines quite similar to the Dutch jersey from the 88 Euros, um, which was an Adidas kit as well. No, that would definitely make its way into my wardrobe. That's cool. That's very cool. Nice one. Score out of 10? I'll give that. Yeah, it's an eight, eight and a half. So number two, we've got well a variety of stuff here, some some track suits as well. Oh. Uh, but this is a 1991 Skull Cup winning kit from Adidas. Very cool as well. No, I'm big big. I love those those track suits. Those track tops are, are awesome. I've got a couple of like re- they're remakes and all the actual original like shell track suits from that time, but they're they're so cool. No, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that as well. I like the long sleeves as well. The, the three stripe coming all the way down the sleeves. That's that's superb. I'll, uh, that's an eight out of 10 as well. Decent. Right, next up we've got the, I think it's a 94, 95. A little bit of a, a Marmite one, this one. Um, purple and green stripes, color over front. Big fan. I've, I've actually seen this on, um, you know, sometimes I follow a lot of vintage football shirt pages and stuff on Instagram. Um, and this is one that's crossed, crossed my eye before. As you say, I think a lot of people, it can, go each one each way with people but I'm a, I'm a huge fan of this that's a nine out of ten for me that would definitely be on my in my summer wardrobe there we go biggest score so far if anybody's got one i think jackson uh jackson might be interested oh yeah definitely uh here we go it's the i think it's the 86 87 home top made by umbro i don't mind it i don't mind i like a little bit of the shorter tight you know kind of shorter sleeves and the, and the tighter fit um around that that's a it's still, it's not not quite my style, but uh, it's not bad at all. I'll give that a 6.5. We'll take it. Right, next up, it's probably the most beloved hip strip, I'd say. Um, yeah. Of recent times, the, the Frank Graham group, Adidas number here. We've got uh, John Collins, one of the proclaimers, and Chris Cadden mm. modeling it. So, uh, what are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going kind of dirty, that. But that's, no, that's, that's special. That's a proper... That's one for the that's one for the ages. That's jersey. That you'll do well to, to de- get a better one than that. That's a nine, a strong nine, strong nine out of ten. Uh, we thought we had to include one of these Raj goalkeeper kits from the nineties. So um, here's Jim Layton modelling that. If you ignore <laughs> the shoulder pads, <laughs> I was I was I was about to say the colour scheme. I can actually get behind. I'm, I'm the shoulder pads uh, could be a little bit could be a little bit much. I don't, I don't mind it to be fair. I think a lot of those gold strips were quite, were very bold around that time. It's a, a good seven out of 10 for me, that. Well then, Jim. This one we had to include, it's the Scottish Cup winning kit. Um, mm. Maybe not something you'd typically have in football street wear, but definitely a kit that's gone down in history. Yeah, I think it will be one that will be, uh, not just for the significance of it, but I think actually the, for the style of it as well. I think it will, um, 
it will be one that in future in you know 10 20 years it will be very highly sought after i'm, I'm actually even just the little leaves um underneath this the sponsor sign are really cool and now it's really clean and smart it's a it's a good uh, eight eight out of ten that eight, eight and a half nice one we've got the 1970s kind of stanton kit we'll call it can't get any more classic than this really no, you can't. Round neck, proper cuff sleeves. No, that's that's a screamer. It's a nine as well. That's um, a nine. I love them. Yeah, I love it. Great. Just to finish off, obviously one you've already got in your wardrobe. But any thoughts on the one you've been wearing this season? I like it actually. It's uh, it's it's not bad at all. Uh, it's um, maybe not gonna go down in history. Maybe maybe for the sentimental touch, especially with the with the NHS um, side of things. So I'll give it. I'll give it an eight. I'll give it an eight. A decent finish. Cheers for playing along. No worries. Obviously, um, Jackson, over the, the last wee bit, we've spoke about um, you know um, your sort of interests out with with football, with that being music, um, you know, artwork and, and such like. Um, when when a player sort of has has a couple of options on on the table, um, you know, obviously, um, you know, your football aspirations are going to be sort of at the forefront of your mind, but. How much of an impact does the sort of city or the area you're going to be living in? Um, how much does that enter your mind and um, for sort of indulging your other interests? So with football, how much does that play on your mind when you're you're sort of deciding where you're you're going next, if you like? Yeah, absolutely, it plays a massive role. I think, as you say, the footballing decision is always going to be at the forefront when when it comes to um, any moves or decisions you make in your career. But especially, you know, when it lifestyle is 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 equally as important and for players like myself who do have a you know a very um broad um scope of interests you know i i need you need that other aspect of your life to be right as well to then to to make sure your on-field performances are going to be be right and you're going to be happy and focused and all of those things um you know kind of balance off each other so yeah it does play a big role in in Personally, in my in my life, it it's, uh, plays a massive role. The city that you live in and the, the area where where you, you know you choose to live your life, it's important. Kind of broaching on some of your your other interests, I think you're quite a keen reader, um, and you also seem to have uh, quite a lot of interest in environmentalism. It, there seems to be a kind of culture of environmentalist thinking in Australia that's quite different to a lot of other parts of the world. Um, maybe partly because of Aboriginal land rights and how that affects. Uh, political decisions mm-hmm. in Australia, but also how how close Australians are to their uh, to their biomes. Uh, is that something mm-hmm. that you think informs your thinking, and and do you see a, a kind of difference between uh, European attitudes to environmentalism and and your own? I do think that does play a role. What you've just touched on there, in particular, um, having grown up around that, um, I think we just have a, Australia has become, in particular, well, I can't say Australia as a whole because we still have. We still have a lot of demons in our own in, a, in our own way, but um, a lot of the people, my family, and people were very, very self aware of, of what Australia is as a nation and its colonial past and how that has affected Indigenous land and the, and the, the you know and the, the culture of the country in that way. And I definitely do think that has played a role in the way we approach environmentalism. Maybe individual. I do think it's still too individualist. I think that is probably the biggest thing about european environmentalism and you know i think just in general and it's it is put down to the individual we are almost guilted in into thinking that you know if you don't sort your plastic and your recycle and you know and your garbage then like you're not you're at fault you're the reason why we are struggling when it's such a, it's it's on a totally different scale to that of course these little things help and people should still do that and to be conscious of it and I'm always trying to push whether it's at the football club or at home I'm always trying to you know just try and make small changes that can um that do make a difference but at the end of the day it is still too individualist and I think that is the way that it's kind of will struggle to make a big make a difference on a, on a big scale while we're still you know asking people to to make those to think that you know that's enough um you know whereas commercial and product plastic production on, on the industrial scale is still the, the biggest problem and that you know at the end of the day we'll, until we make correct those kinds of changes and you have to hold these kinds of bigger powers accountable 
um, that's the only way you can make real change, I guess, on on a on the big scale. But that doesn't mean that individuals still shouldn't do try and do you know the best that they can as well. See, within that spirit, um, Jackson, obviously, um, you know, we've seen over the last year, um, with with regards to football, is someone like Marcus Rashford who has, you know, stepped up and really made used his platform, if you like, for for a force for good. Um, there's a club in sort of England in Forest Green Rovers who are obviously big into sort of the the environmental impact of of a football club. I know that Hibs themselves have got the the greenest club in Scotland. Um, sort of scheme going on, and it's a continuing thing. Um, do do you sort of believe that that football both as you know a collective and footballers as individuals can use their platform to sort of if not change the world then certainly raise awareness of, of such issues definitely i think that's uh you know just to use covid as a as a as an example i'll never forget being down in england, england and watching one of matt hancock's first press conferences and um you know after we kind of went into lockdown and i remember one of his one of his first quite one of the his first press conferences and he was talking about Premier League footballers and what, what Premier League could do to, to you know, to help the situation and everything. And I was like, well, hang on a second, like the health sector, you, you know, you're part of the health and you're asking, you know, this is this is the level of, of which, you know, football is, is pushed into the forefront in on issues such as race. And um, as you say, Marcus Rashford now is taking it into that, you know, serious social change can be made. He's shown that the impact of what he's done um and it is amazing to see and I, I do think that um it is a can only be a good thing for, for players to continue to use that platform to to try and it, it, at the end of the day you as you say raising awareness and then pushing um kind of uh substantial change through the official channels i'll, I'll call them um but you know it can start with with something with something like that and um you know, I think uh, you know, Marcus Rashford has really put that into perspective probably for a lot of people of, of what, you know, a voice and a singular drive, I guess, can can do and um, the amount of pressure that that did put on the government to eventually, you know, backtrack on that original policy. And, you know, I, I think it's a, it could potentially be a big turning point. Hopefully, um, you know, hopefully more athletes in, in general and will continue to, you know, push for social change and social justice in whatever department you know they're either passionate about which is close to them or um you know just just in whatever way they think they can make a difference and sort of finally on that kind of takes us quite nicely onto the original um comment that you made about you know footballers or in, indeed just any sports person pursuing other passions uh what would you be your message to fellow sportsmen and women who maybe have uh, things that they're passionate about or even political persuasions that they, they kind of want to pursue, but they're, they're struggling to, to find their voice? Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. I think the first thing you got, as you try and do it, is find out yourself what it is that you are passionate about. I think I know during my kind of experiences in football, um, we can be kind of pushed into, into this kind of... Uh, I don't want to call it like a like a box, but I suppose it's just this kind of singular set of like interests that it seems to be it can seem to fall across, and it's just it's impossible. Like it can't be that way. I'm sure there are people with creative and um, you know other ambitions and other values that they that they want to find in, within themselves, and you know it does take a little bit of um, self exploration i guess and and discovering what it is you, you want to do and who who you want to be and you don't need to share it either like i think sometimes it's it's now it's seen as that um if you do have that you have to kind of push that into the forefront of your personality and what you what you give to the public and it doesn't have to be that way but you just hope that it can be you know that more people are comfortable enough eventually when they find those passions that they do want to share them and then they can find more you know like minded people and maybe you know, people within the football community in particular who have always thought, oh, that's always something I was interested in, or that's something I wanted to, and then you can connect on that front and, and you know, push it into something totally different. Great. Well, it was uh, a huge honour to, to speak to Jackson. He's a, he's a really interesting guy, very um, you know, diverse chat, as you could tell, and uh, it's good to see a footballer quite quite open and honest with his with his other interests. Um, obviously, linking to Jackson um, and recent Hibs events, we we can't go a podcast without talking about Hibs matches. So 
Uh, we saw, uh, obviously, coming off the back of a defeat to Motherwell uh, after our last podcast, we, we managed to get a, a pretty good win against Ross County, obviously Jackson's previous club. We had to, we had to fight for it, those two. Yeah, um, I, I think um, the, sort of, the Ross County result was big just to get back, back to, to winning ways. Um, and it's, it's not an easy place to go. You've got a team fighting for their, for their life up there. We've went up there and we've, we've got three points. Um, you know, the, the two games that... Um, the two other games that took place in March, obviously Livingston and St Johnston, um, you could say um, one point from six there is quite disappointing. But you've got to look at it and say Aberdeen didn't gain any ground on us. Um, you know, you can argue and say oh, that's more because Aberdeen are bad than we are good, but does it matter? <laughs> you know, it's, um, we touched on it last time, finishing third this season is huge for the potential um, potential benefits of doing so. So if, I think, again four points from from nine in March and I think we're now slightly further ahead of Aberdeen than we were. Um it's it's good. <laughs> That's about as insightful as I can be. <laughs> well yeah, it's it's such a mixed bag of results and also uh, there's not as many games as we, we could talk about last time, so that's probably all you can say is that uh, at least we're, we're further ahead of Aberdeen. I'd actually erase the St Johnson game from my mind because that was the first game after the Motherwell result, so not a great one, but then we did, yeah, we bounced back against Ross County. And as you said, we had to come from behind for the first time to win a match, which was which was good. And then obviously Livingston will, will be disappointed with getting a draw, I'd say. But, you know, if you look at Livingston's home form and also, uh, you know, the fact that we have struggled when we've gone behind in games, I think we, we probably deserved a little bit more from the second half. But um, it's a valuable point in the end. I think if if you want to put a positive spin on it for the for the last two games, it's actually four points from six. I, I kind of made a bit of an error previously, but not only that, it's it's four points gained from losing positions, um, which is something that it's, it's been a real monkey on the back, and it's something that's becoming more and more prominent. You know, people listing all the games that we went behind and and not taking anything from, and certainly not taking three points from. Suddenly, two games in a row, and um, we've went behind and we've walked away with four points out of six, and again, um, extended our advantage in third place. So. Um, yeah, I think it's it's been another another month where I, it's a whole season that I don't think anyone's going to look back on particularly fondly mm. in terms of you know just the everything that's going on with regards to the season. But if we finish third, um, then I think it, it's a good season, and I think it means that next season could really be a memorable one. With again, I keep saying it, the potential rewards of finishing third. Yeah, well, that's it. we alluded to it in the interview of Jackson, but it's clearly. Uh, he didn't hide it. It's a big draw for him, the potential to play in Europe. So, you know, that's one player who's already at the club sort of admitting that European football is a big factor in making decisions. So clearly it affects the other players that we can we can try to uh, to attain in the summer. Obviously, we're on uh, international break at the moment. Some people love it, some people hate it. But obviously, lower league football is still continuing. And I think we've we've got a couple of results we maybe want to talk about from our from our pink neighbours. So I'll let you <laughs> I'll let you kick off there. I, I can't think what you you possibly mean. Has something <laughs> happened with Hearts over the last few days? Uh, no, I I think um I think you've you've um you said it is it's um I I, I don't mind international football. I, I I'd rather watch Hibs, but if if Scotland are playing, um I'll watch it. Um, but I I was still obviously it gives a wee bit of interest in what's going on in going on in the leagues. Um, I actually completely forgot Hearts were play, playing um in the Scottish Cup the other night, and I I went on to Twitter and seen loads of Hibs fans like retweeting. <laughs> Broner winning two one, but it didn't actually see who they were beating two one. So I had to um, I had to go on to the BBC website to see who Broner were playing, and I seen they were playing Hearts, and I actually confused Broner with Cove Rangers at first. Oh, yeah. thought, well, you know, it's only a league difference, and I actually thought, "Oh no, I mean, they're Highland League. That's like <laughs> unbelievable." Um, yeah, so I mean, it was obviously we got a, we got a fair bit of hilarity out of that. Um, I, I I think that's football rivalry, isn't it? It's the kind of thing you've got to enjoy. Um, I dare say we we've had a few embarrassing results over the years. Nothing to that level, as mm. to be said. Um, that that we've we've taken a bit of bit of mick, um, a bit of people taking the Mickey from. So yeah. Um, and then and then Saturday, you know, you thought, oh, well, they'll they'll bounce back. You know, there'll be a real sort of fire in the belly. And I was actually um, I was dropping my partner off somewhere, and we were in the car, um, and. I got a row for, you know, beeping the horn when um, Queen of the South scored after about 90 <laughs> seconds. Um, so, yeah, um, an, an enjoyable few days. And the fact we managed to get a, a bite off a, a um, relatively minor local celebrity <laughs> on Twitter just um, adds to the adds to the fun. Now, you mentioned that I would like to uh, sort of extend an apology to you and Cameron for absolutely nothing. It was <laughs> it was catch of a day for sure. One thing I will say for you is that <laughs> at least he can take it. You know, some of his chat is uh, is sh- but certainly he, he doesn't block you for it. He'll uh, he'll go tit for tat, although I think he lost that one. 
<laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, no, no, um, it was it was a good laugh, and um, the fact that he kept sort of digging and um, the further <laughs> into he got as well just kind of made it more enjoyable. Um, and it, it was just funny watching a guy get increasingly rattled. But again, that that's what football football's all about is that kind of that kind of fun in games. And you know, you you want guys to be that passionate about it and to really get that upset that their team's going through through a bad patch. And the fact that it's a Hearts fan getting really upset about them going through a bad patch just makes it all the more enjoyable <laughs> so so no one no one's going to no one's going to complain about that no um I, th- I think the other thing that's obviously um caught right back back to sort of um hibs related is obviously um there was the, the news broke at the weekend that um scott allen has moved on temporarily mm-hmm. um a bit, a bit of discussion around that um whether it's a good move whether it's a bad move and and sort of you know a few isolated suggestions that there might be something sort of um Sinister might be the wrong word, but something sort of untoward with regards to um what what's your thoughts on that, Gal? Uh so I mean I can see why the statement from Hibbs it leaves a lot to the imagination. So I can see so why some people might be a little bit skeptical about that. Uh what kind of clarified things for me and, and has me pretty assured that this is just to help Scott back to fitness after his his uh time out with ill health is his interview that he gave with the uh Inverness TV. Um he made it quite clear that he he's there to get some game time. Uh, it wasn't going to happen at Hibs, and and from the statement, it, it it's kind of his choice. You know, he he doesn't feel he can make the same impact of a moment. He's had the equivalent of like two seasons out without a preseason, so um, you know, if he's not going to get bounce games, I think it it makes complete sense, really. Yeah, I mean, um, I, as I say, I, I don't think there's anything really. I personally don't think there's anything. I just I found the initial sort of statement from him just a bit strange, and that the the manager said he wanted to keep him within the group, which suggests he had plans for him, and then sort of said, well, the player didn't think he could contribute. It's like, well, if the player didn't think he could contribute, you're not playing him, so you clearly didn't think he can contribute. So why why did you want to keep him here when he wanted to go and play? It it just kind of it it sat a bit. But I think it's one of those things that when you see it in written form, it probably reads differently from how it was said and yeah i think there's um again it's another thing we've touched on um in the last episode and i dare say we'll touch on again is this kind of lockdown not being at the club not being engaged not being at games it makes you overanalyze everything because there's nothing else to do and um, so yeah i i think it i think you kind of just have to accept it as what is the guy's moved on to to get some games he'll come back and have a full preseason, and hopefully the, the scott allen we all know and love will be be back playing in green and white next season and it certainly seems that the manager and the player expect that to be the case yeah exactly i mean even when scott you could tell something wasn't right at the start of the season, but but Jack was still playing him. Um, you know, he was starting most of our games, and I think that's because everybody in Scotland knows how good a player he is. So, um, yeah, if he can get any kind of fitness back into his legs and and start to feel comfortable playing full matches again, he'll be he'll be a huge asset for us, and certainly like a, a new signing really. Talking about departures, actually, uh, something kind of relevant for the podcast is we saw Kenny Miller leave his uh, position as communications manager. Um, I believe Hibs have a temporary person in post now and they'll have a new permanent replacement in May. Just like to, to thank Kenny for, for his time and I know he helped get this podcast off the ground. So um, I didn't want to let that slide by. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, um, obviously, um, just just to clarify, um, that point is um, the, the podcast has nothing officially to do with Hibs um, because I, I know that that's something that some people might want to run with. Right. Um, Ken, Kenny just kind of helped us um, um, get get a couple of get the first couple of guests on, um, just purely because um, you know, um, obviously you you and Kenny have got um, had a bit of chat and and you were able to approach him for that. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, th- I think um, as I said on the um, on the forum um, that. I don't. There was sort of again. Is there anything going on behind the scenes with people leaving? I don't think so. I think um, marketing and comms tends to be a kind of a position where people do move on fairly regularly. It's one where people are always keen to climb the ladder, take on new challenges. Anywhere I've worked, that's had sort of that kind of position. It's been an eighteen to 21, 24 month um sort of sort of role. So yeah, um, I think Kenny's obviously just fancy doing something new, and I dare say someday also coming at Hibs with their own ideas, and we'll we'll see how that goes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to sort of go back to to on the field uh, matters is obviously we we've spoke to to Jackson and you know we've kind of told him he needs to stay next season. Uh, we we've spoke about um sort of Scott coming coming back in and and being um fully fit again. It's actually quite interesting um to think of the sort of almost conundrum we're going to have in in mm. midfield next season is trying to how to fit a lot of these sort of good players in. As you know, you've got um Joe Newell's obviously someone who has performed well this season and, and Jack Ross clearly likes him because. Every time he's sort of been out, as soon as he's fit, he's been back in the team again. Um, I think we've we've all got a lot to see from um, McGinnis. I mean, he's going to be like a new signing in the summer because we really haven't seen what he he has to offer this season. 
Um, we've got Scott to come back in. We've hopefully got, still going to have um, Jackson there. We've got Chris Cadden and we've got Martin Boyle, who you are all vying for some positions within that midfield. And um, you've got Jamie Murphy as well. And um, you've got Stevie Mallon potentially to come back in. Um, you know that that um, I, I'm not even sure what the com- contract situation is with Halberg. If he's he's still potentially here next season as well. You know, it's it's an area of the team where we have a lot of numbers. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's any feeling that we maybe need to add a, a different type in there. And Alex Gogic as well, I completely forgot about him. Yeah, I think it's an area that Hibbs will be hoping, certainly internally, that uh, we have a little bit more fortune with because, as you've as you've mentioned there, we've been quite unfortunate with injuries. Obviously, Scott's illness, uh, Mallon wanting game time, so he's he's been away. McGinnis can't really catch a break at the moment. Um, Joe Neal even you know picked up uh, an injury that lasted longer than we thought it would so yeah there's there's definitely a lot of questions to answer there I think one of them is is whether Jackson will do what we we asked him to do and, and stick around um, I think he's probably uh, cemented his place at the moment he's he's been you know for me anyway the, the best midfield performer in recent times and you know there's there's also questions of like the wide players how they come into it because we seem to play better with two up front but you know d- does that mean we're leaving out one of Doidge or Nisbet sometimes they don't play well without each other it's 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 kind of difficult and I think Chris Cadden hasn't gotten much game time recently but he he won't be happy to sit up on bench either I, th- I think I touched on that um, when I, sp- I spoke previously is that I think um you know Nisbet and Doidge can play better when they're playing together but that then leaves you the conundrum of possibly having to leave out one off Boyle or Cadden who I think have both played well this season um you know, um, so then, or if you play Boyle up front to fit both of them in, it means leaving out one of Dodge and Nisbet. And I mean, Martin's obviously went up front and, and scored a few goals this season. So, you know, it's it's an ob- I think it's a good problem to have when you're kind of trying to work out how do I fit um, as many sort of good players on the, the park as possible. But I think, yeah, to touch on what you said, I think so, um, both Jackson and I think Joe Neal are kind of like, it's those two and others in the midfield. I think that certainly, look, they look like they're the kind of, I hate to use the term automatic starters, but they certainly look like they're the guys in possession of the shirt and it's theirs to lose. It was quite interesting to hear um, Jackson talk about um, Stephen Bradley, um, who obviously made one yeah. sort of cameo appearance this season when we were, was it 4-1 up at Hamilton? He came on and by all accounts um, looked very looked very impressive. Yeah, nearly scored. Um, and then he's kind of not been, not, been, um, not been seen a lot since. And I think he's carrying an injury at the moment. Um, so that, that's going to be an interesting one next season is with, with regards to sort of a young player um, potentially coming into the team. I think again it comes back to this third place thing <laughs> sort of situation. If if we're playing, you know, um potentially eight European games, um, we're gonna to have to, to have a bit of rotation within the squad because it, it's gonna be um it's gonna be a hard a hard graft. Um and you know, you see it with, with teams like Rangers and Celtic in Scotland and you know, much more so down south. Clubs carry these huge scores just so they can rotate through the League Cup, through the FA Cup, through the league, through the, the European competition. It's, it's again, it's a good problem to have. Yeah, exactly. Um, talking about obviously positions where we've got quite a, a lot of talent, it's, it's somewhere that we'll maybe have a dearth at the start of next season is the goalkeeper position. Obviously, Marciano is an answer. He'll be moving on to Pasha's new, and I'm, I'm sure he'll get a, a very good move. Um, he's been excellent for Hibs, in my opinion, certainly the best keeper I've seen. Um, but I think Dabrowski is also out of contract and I'm sure he's at an age now where he'll be wanting to start some matches. So uh, have you got any thoughts about what Hibs might sort of do, what their tactic will be? Yeah, I find, I find Kevin um, a bit of a strange one in the sense that he's clearly been highly rated by Hibs um, and whatever he's went on loan has been well thought of. And I know that um, Dumbarton were very impressed from earlier in the season and were, were very, you know, sorry to see him come back to Hibs. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's never really pushed to look like again getting a getting a sort of run in the first team or even you know sort of really you know being on the bench and keeping keeping the goalkeeper on his toes there's always been that sort of intermediary there between him and you know Rocky um and you know we've obviously let his contract run down I, I think it's one of the things is for all he's still a young goalkeeper he is in his sort of early 20s now he's not a baby and if he if he's not ready to sort of really be pushing for a first team place now at Hibs is he ever going to be? Um, you know, I, th- I think the days of sort of people saying, "Oh, goalkeepers don't really reach their sort of maturity to their 26, 27, 28, and then peaking in their early thirties. I think that's kind of gone. If you look at over the last sort of probably decade, some of the best 
goalkeepers in the world over that period have been playing first team football for big big clubs at 17 18 year old i think in david de gea manuel neuer um oblak at atletico madrid um, you know um donnarumma um courtois all these guys now we're obviously talking levels here but it, it, i think it still makes the point that you know if, if you're good enough, you're old enough, kind of thing, and including for a goalkeeper now, obviously you still learn and you still, you know, you pick up your confidence or whatever as you get older. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, I think we're probably going to see at least one new goalkeeper coming to Hibs next season, and I think it'll be one off the other two might get a contract extension. Um, and, you know, yeah, I think, um, and I, I agree, I think over the piece, um, Rocky's been pretty solid for us. And yeah, I think, um, I think if we could have kept him, it would have just been a good piece of continuity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but... Obviously, it's hard to begrudge him a move. As much as Hibs fans, we 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 probably selfishly want him to stick around forever. He's he's been here five years, and you know what? That might that might tie into Dabrowski not really getting an opportunity. It's just that um, Hibs rarely have that goalkeeper stability. But in recent years, we've had Mascarano, and we haven't had you know much of a reason to to look to change things. Obviously, Bogdan came in and made a good impact, but um, that was only temporary. And and clearly, uh, Offi has had a number one shirt. So looking ahead then, we've got um, top six fixtures coming up. It's never an easy run in the top six. In fact, I think after the split, Hibs have a kind of mixed record. But in recent years, it's maybe something we've, we've actually done pretty well in. Yeah, what, uh, what are you sort of looking for from the split? Is it just about consolidating third place no matter what the results are? Are we just hoping Aberdeen continue to, to sh** the bed? You know, I'm kind of going to, um, you know, probably put a bit of, bit of a curse on this. But I, I honestly think if, if we can better Aberdeen's result in the first or second game after the split, then third third place is essentially ours. Obviously, we start off with um, with Rangers um, after the the split, which is, you know, on the one hand, it's obviously a, a tough game because it's Rangers and they're unbeaten this season, and you know they've they've been, I hate to say it, a really really good side mm -hmm. this year. But I think we've 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 given a good account of ourselves against Rangers when we've played them thus far this season, and. On top of that, is there maybe a wee, wee touch of them taking their foot off the gas? Now that they've got the league sewn up, they've got um, they're out of, they're out of Europe now. Obviously, after their their defeat um, last week, I mean, will will maybe rest players with a look at having a good run at the Scottish Cup and and you know securing a double? It's um, yeah, I think um, I think it's it's a chance to certainly go have a go at them. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's difficult to see um, how how Stephen Glass can have such a huge impact at um. Aberdeen in such a short space of time. I think um, I've I've got a couple of mates who are Aberdeen fans because I I lived up there and I think they're pretty much conceding that third place is Hibs. Um, I I I think they probably have to win at least three of their um, of their remaining games and hope Hibs don't win any. And I I just I don't see Aberdeen winning three of their remaining games. Unfortunately, or sorry, fortunately, unfortunately for them, fortunately for us. Yeah, 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 touch wood. Um, but it, it can happen, but it seems unlikely. Okay, then, so if we're we're fairly confident that third place will be wrapped up, hopefully soon enough, um, but again, trepidation. Hibs fans have always got to be cautious. Uh, to flip a question that you asked, Jackson, what are some of the teams, or if not teams, locations that you'd be looking for uh, when, when it comes to Europa League draw, anywhere you'd like to go? Well, I was actually um, thinking about this the other day. Is, um, so I always like to kind of go somewhere where, where you know, I, I know the area or, or know people. I like to see new places, but for, for something that's quite short term. Um, and I, I've got um, I've got a friend who lives in Rome. Um, so And I, I believe Roma is a potential <laughs> potential opponent. If, and um, I think it's if we qualify for the group stages of the Europa League. So I think, I think Roma would be a good shot and it'd be pretty mental as well, I think. Um, I've also got a, a friend who lives in Montpellier, so I, I don't think Montpellier can get in through the um, into Europe this season through the French League. I think Marseille can, and it's only a couple hours on the train up the road, so, so somewhere like that. Um, I think um, one of the Seville teams. Um, I, th I think um, Real Betis is probably the most most likely of those two. Um, I, I think that would be just an amazing trip as well. And I, I, I kind of I'm, I'm going quite sort of Southern Europe centric because I think we've done a lot of Eastern Europe and sort of Scandinavia in the last few years. Um, so it'd be quite good to to see something a bit different. So I, th I think one of those or, um, I would I would love a crack at an English team. Um, yeah, definitely. Just because um, you know I, I think um we've seen in the last few years um I said uh, Liverpool against Hearts um I think Hearts gave a really good account of themselves there. Um, certainly better than they did in Brora, <laughs> and I think um, Aberdeen against Burnley again. Aberdeen were actually really quite unfortunate there. Um, I think um, so. You know, you're you're always up against it, but it'd be a really good way to go and test yourself. I think West Ham would be a brilliant trip. I think a, a trip down to London, you know, huge stadium. You could you could imagine if 
you know, COVID permitting him to take in, you know, between seven and 15,000 down to West Ham. I mean, it would be an absolutely colossal hip support that would go down. Um, yeah, I, th- I think some, something like that, like a really sort of big couple of glamour ties would be would be good. I mean, you know, Bromby and Mulder are, are decent sized teams, but you really want somebody that's, you know, a real, a real name in football. That's it. And when all likelihood is we're going to be playing a team with a bigger budget and probably more European pedigree. Uh, and, you know, without being too pessimistic, chances are Hibs are going to get knocked out at one of the earliest stages of a competition. You want that opportunity to to have a bit of a glamour tie. I don't think I've seen one in my time as a Hibs fan. And actually looking, you mentioned West Ham there. You look at some of the teams fighting for the Europa League spot of a moment. You've got like Liverpool, Tottenham, yeah. Everton potentially. So, yeah, there's so many like really tasty ties in there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think I've been fortunate enough that I've seen um, I've seen Hibs play um, a really, really good Anderlecht side in the the early nineties, um, which was a which was a great tie home. I, I remember always being fascinated because I was only about six or seven at the time, um, and the fact that there was um, Hibs fans in the away end, I thought I thought was like um, I thought it was quite um, quite cool at the time. Um, and I also I also um, seen us play AEK Athens, which we were you know. They had a couple of guys who went on to be sort of um, stalwarts of the the Greek team that won the won the Euros. Um, I remember the guy um, Sartas in particular who came on as a sub easter and completely changed the game. I think he scored at least one of the goals, um, and he he you know had a real pedigree in Greek football and also in um in I think in Spanish football. I think he played in La Liga for a few years as well. Um, so yeah, I mean I, I've seen I've been lucky to see him play a couple of um sort of you know reasonable sized teams, um but I I think um yeah I think some like um, sort of Liverpool or, or Everton or you know something like that would be a real um, a real sort of dream tie if you like yeah the countdown continues <laughs> yeah absolutely let's just make sure we get these points um, points in, on the board or, um, this, this could come back to haunt us in a few weeks time oh god don't worry I'll delete it if it does <laughs> Okay, so um, thanks again, then, Gav, for another another good chat. And um, we'll be back next month um, with an as yet to be revealed guest. So yeah, we'll we'll speak to you all in a month's time. Thank you.